Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome Ann Lord back to the program. Ann is a contributor for Young Voices, and Ann, you uh, you wear a couple of other hats as well. Uh, for those meeting you for the first time, tell us just a little bit about yourself. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate being on the program with you. Um, so I am the lead for government affairs for the Vandenberg Coalition. We are an experts network of foreign affairs advisors and national security experts. So that is my day job. And then by night, I like to write about China's illegal fishing practices. Yeah, I was going to say, you, if you're if you're looking at foreign or international affairs, you you have no shortage of things to focus on. But this is a topic that I don't hear a lot about, at least in mainstream press. Um, talk to me about uh, about first of all um, fishing, and I understand the the uh, f- the ocean's uh, fish population is actually threatened because there are some countries, China, for instance, that don't abide by international rules that govern fishing. What exactly is is the nature of the problem? No, definitely, and I totally agree that it's not something you generally see um, being covered, but it's really a threatening problem, and it's particularly important when we consider our global fish supply. So the world's fishing population or fishing supply is in danger because of illegal fishing, which causes an overall economic loss of tens of billions of dollars yearly. And in particular, what we see is that China is the number one perpetrator of what we call IUU, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, So this is in part because they have overfished their own domestic fish supplies and need to provide for their own population. So they're seeking viable sources elsewhere. Um, Now, in order to support these these practices, they have this massive fleet that's estimated to have around 12,000 to 17,000 fishing vessels, which is well, well more than any other um, country has to support their work. So what will happen is that China will go out to countries, EZZs, and pardon all of these acronyms, but I think they're important that we cover them. So these EZZs, which are economic exclusive zones, which is the nautical territory of sea of the sea of a nation and is within that nation's jurisdiction and overfish. And so generally this is happening to countries that don't have the ability to go back and counter China's IUU or illegal um, unreported and unregulated fishing. So basically what we have going on is China has acted irresponsibly domestically and is now acting irresponsibly as a state on the world stage, is preying on weaker states and is harming the rest of the world. So what we need to see happen is the United States needs to lead in addition with their allies to counter this um, illegal fishing that China's perpetrating. So I've got now I have so many questions. The the, <laughs> sure. the territorial waters that you talk about, um, do, how far do those extend, you know, from from the actual nations themselves? I mean, how far do those zones go out? Sure. Those zones generally expand 200 nautical miles. So it's relatively close to these countries. Um, so it's not just as if China sort of stumbled upon this fish stock supply and then all of a sudden, oh, well, we didn't necessarily know it was so close to this other nation. This is an intentional action uh, perpetrated by this Chinese Communist Party um, to go and prey upon weaker nations. And the problem with that is that then their domestic fish supply stocks are reduced, and then they don't have time to repopulate in such a way that's responsible for the rest of the world. And this becomes a larger problem because 3 billion people of the world's population get a fifth of their diet from fish protein. Um, And so when we have things like a looming food supply crisis that's caused by an increase in fuel cost, this is a real and serious problem. This isn't something that we can just assume is only an issue for countries with um, exclusive economic zones that can't defend themselves or anything. especially when we consider the fact that 90% of the world's remaining commercially viable fish stocks are being exploited, overexploited, or depleted. So the the, the countries that, that China is taking advantage of in this regard, um, is it that they don't have, for instance, like their version of a Coast Guard that could go out there and discourage these Chinese vessels from, from encroaching on their, their territorial waters? Right. That's exactly right. They don't necessarily have the resources to fend off China. And I think when you're looking at that massive number of 12,000 to 17,000 vessels in comparison to a country with a much smaller GDP and much more um, 
less ability and wherewithal to push back against a larger country, it's going to be incredibly difficult to defend your own EZZ. Um, and that's why China really gets away with this. Um, additionally, given uh, the complexity of understanding uh, territorial waters and the vastness of the world's oceans, it's very difficult to monitor without coordination between other states and to ensure that this is something that is not continu continuing to happen. So what are some of the likely solutions that uh, the U.S. and other countries might uh, uh, utilize in order to encourage China to, to stop doing this? Absolutely. So last year, the Biden administration released a memo about ways to combat illegal ship fishing. And in part, this was really building on a lot of the great work that the Trump administration had been doing years prior. Um, and the memo is acting as a roadmap. But as we all know, uh, roadmaps are just maps. And unless you actually get in the car and drive, you're not necessarily going to get anywhere. And so we haven't seen a lot of tangible t action taken from the memo put out by the Biden administration. Um, one example, though, that they, has, that they have been moving on that has been really great um, has been leveraging anti-illegal fishing efforts in coordination with the Quad, which is an agreement between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia to improve maritime donations domain awareness, uh, meaning that they would link surveillance systems to track Ill illegal fishing. That's a great model. However, the Quad's agreement does not is expand all over the world. And Chinese illegal fishing spans to the coasts of Africa, the Caribbean, um, South America. Wow. And so those, those, yeah, right. So it, it's quite expansive. It's not just where you would think of in that sort of Southeast Asia area. It's, it's in our own backyard. Um, and the Quads Agreement doesn't cover the areas in our own backyard. Yard. So what we need to be doing as the United States is stepping up as a leader to increase surveillance coordination with these new partnership and enforcement mechanisms to increase maritime domain awareness with our partners um, to ensure that these things don't continue to happen in our own backyard. I boy, I'll tell you, I I don't. Uh, of course, I live uh, far inland, so I don't get to, I don't get tapped into a lot of maritime issues. But this is fascinating. I had no idea that that China was sending this fleet, um, literally everywhere it could go. Um, I take it there are probably some waters that are just not fishable, maybe the Arctic or or the uh, Antarctic waters. Right, exactly. And so those would be those would be areas that we wouldn't necessarily have to be worried about. What we're concerned about mainly are those areas in South America, uh, Southeast Asia, um, and then places like Africa and the Caribbean. And for us, we have a lot of bilateral agreements with those countries to ensure we have free trade and that we are able to benefit from, um, you know, a legal and fair um, free trade agreements with these countries, so we're able to receive the benefits. Um, you know, I think the Navy's top intelligence officer, Rear Admiral Studman, really said it best, is that every other country should not suffer for China's rise. And I think this is in particular one of those areas that we're seeing that. Well, and and it, it I could see where this would be kind of a tricky thing. Look, if it was, if it was some kind of military encroachment, we have militaries for for countering those kinds of things, but this is commercial, and so now there I don't know there has to be more more carrot than stick maybe to to get them to to play by the rules. Right, exactly, and you know that is kind of an interesting question in terms of the uh, domestic versus um, versus military component, and that's one of the way the ways in which our Coast Guard is uniquely positioned to help these other maritime nations in ensuring they're able to push back uh, against the the illegal fishing practice of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, we're very fortunate in that they the Coast Guard is both foreign and, and domestic and as an entity for us. And so that would be another example of something that we could do is really ensuring that our Coast Guard is empowered um, to not just protect uh, uh, general fishing supplies, but also those that matter specifically to the United States and that this doesn't become a greater food crisis uh, for us and globally. And we're down to about one minute here, but uh, you had mentioned China's fleet is is huge. It's you know twelve to seventeen thousand vessels. How does that compare to uh, to other large nations? I'm thinking like India or the U.S. or Japan. Um, what what do their fleets, their commercial fishing fleets, look like? 
I have to say it's um, compared to other other countries of China's economic development levels, it is absolutely massive. And that's why we see organizations like IUU, the Illegal Unreported and Unregulated Fishing in- Index, ranking China worse out of 100, the worst country out of 152 fishing countries. And that's kind of really impressive when you consider the magnitude um, of the amount of fishing the world does and just recognizing how much damage they can be doing and continue to do if we don't push back. Well, and I will confess, I did not realize, you know, three billion people in the world depend on fish as, as a primary, you know, source of, of food for their diets. That's uh, that's sobering. Right, exactly. Us Midwesterners often forget it's not just beef. <laughs> right, <laughs> and potatoes. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. Again, we're, we're talking with Ann Lord. Ann is a Young Voices contributor. And Ann, for those who would like to follow you on social media or follow your work, where's the best place to find you? You can check me out on Twitter at A.T. Lord, or you can check out the work of the Vandenberg Coalition at VandenbergCoalition.com. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome a familiar voice back to the program. That would be Amanda Griffiths. And Amanda, for those who are meeting you for the first time, take just a moment and tell us just a bit about yourself. Uh, Well, Brian, it's wonderful to be back on with you. Uh, I am a Young Voices contributor and commentator. uh, And I recently, in fact, moved uh, from Uh, Los Angeles, where I was a student at UCLA, to Madison, Wisconsin, where I am a PhD student at UW-Madison. I study political theory and international relations, and I also write about uh, the market and education and civil liberties and pretty much all things um, uh, for Young Voices. Well, we've got a doozy of a topic to discuss today, and uh, we're we're talking about uh, a threat to the gig workers of the world. Uh, but this goes back a little ways to to a piece of legislation passed in California a few years ago, Assembly Bill 5. Let's set the stage with what uh, what did AB 5 purport to do and, and what was the counter that followed it in 2020? And then that'll bring us to where we are today. Sure. Excellent question. So Assembly Bill 5, AB 5, we're going to call it. Bookmark the fact that it was passed by legislators. All right, it was passed in the California legislature, uh, and it was a bill that purported to help fortify benefits uh, uh, for gig workers, essentially, independent contractors, companies like Lyft and Uber and other really startups, especially at that point, needed to start treating these part-time, not even part-time, but independent contractors as full-time employees. Now, that means, yes, giving them medical benefits, giving them paid time off, but this is stuff that's really impractical. As anyone who's listening, who is a gig worker, who's driven for Uber, has ever delivered for DoorDash, knows that's really impractical stuff and actually limits the worker because what then that does is it forces the worker to be logging out, clocking in, clocking out. You have a maximum number of hours. Well, you have to work this many hours this week. You have to work this many hours that week. You can't do a side hustle and say, well, I've got rent coming up. I'd like to work a little bit more if you've already hit that standard time. So it really curtailed workers' freedom. A lot of these freedoms were things that workers actually escaped Escape full time employment, escaped, uh, escape complete employment in order to be able to enjoy. And the companies themselves, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, et cetera, these startups, they were going to essentially be bankrupted out of the California market and considered vacating the California market entirely. 
Prop 22 is a democratically passed measure. Okay, so we have something that's passed in the legislature versus something that's passed democratically. And it had bipartisan approval. Uh, nearly half of Democrats in California supported the bill, or sorry, supported the proposition as well. And Prop 22 was a workaround that said, these are still independent workers. These are still independent workers, but we're going to allow them these benefits, things like accident protection, things like some kind of insurance policy, insurance funding. So again, it was the best of all possible worlds. Okay, and that brings us to today. So it sounds like the gig workers, at least for the time being in California, have uh, in the in the title of your article escaped big labor's boot. But where does what does it look like as as we move forward? I know one of the things you point out in your article is the the great danger of AB five is it might establish a precedent that could then be spread to either other states or possibly even you know imposed at the national level. Absolutely, and the reason for that is that there's still a legal fight going on for Prop twenty two. So Prop twenty two was initially. Um, it, it was invalidated, it was nullified, it was declared unconstitutional in a California Court of Appeals. The people who brought this suit uh, were well, partly they were funded by and, and uh, coached by the SEIU, uh, Service Employees International Union, a lot of big unions, big labor, very much against this policy, which sounds kind of paradoxical because it helps independent workers. Uh, but of course, as we'll probably get into, Big labor doesn't like little independent workers very much. So then on March 13th, there was a higher court that overturned the nullification. So it's an overturning of the overturning, right? And now we're waiting for the Supreme Court in California, very likely, in fact, to decide to hear this case. We, uh, we, you know, we have word about that. So this is one of those things where everyone's on tenderhooks, just waiting to see what happens. Because yes, it could set a national precedent. I anticipate it would uh, send shockwaves throughout the gig economy, and and yes, set a precedent for the future of independent work around the nation. Now, I understand independent work is not for everyone. And I say this as someone who just in the last five years finally stopped sticking my toe in the water and just went ahead and did a full cannonball right into uh, becoming a gig worker. And and there's, there is a certain amount of security that you give up when you uh, become an independent contractor in that respect. On the other hand, there's a pretty significant amount of freedom that you gain. And uh, I, I couldn't fathom going back to um, a corporate job because of that. I, I, want, I want to be able to chart my own course, even if it does have a few challenges that come along with that. Absolutely, yes. And the the drivers agreed with you. So there's been sub there has been there substantive internal polling, right? And external polling as well. So we what we have is that there have been uh let's see, sixty to seventy percent of gig drivers voted for the measure and following its implementation. Uh, Benenson Strategy conducted a survey that actually said, that actually showed that gig workers continue to experience benefits and even more now support the measure, uh, close to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent. Um, and research conducted by Edelman Intelligence confirms this as well. So this is something that is popular with gig workers. This is something that gig workers want. They want this freedom. They like Prop 22. Big labor doesn't. Well, it's it seems like it really comes down to it's a matter of, of power. Now, I know I've, I've heard at least some rumblings from the national level. I've heard, uh, for instance, President Biden talk about, you know, what a blessing this is going to be. Look at us. We're protecting the workers. And I'm like, I don't want your protection. <laughs> you know, thank yeah. you. But uh, it's 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 a blessing from the political class that really I think a lot of us would, would rather do without. Yeah. And again, I, as I point out in the article that by changing the public's conception of what workers are able to do, the power of the independent worker, 
independent workers and the gig economy are disrupting that big business model on which big labor itself relies. Big labor wants you to think that the worker is just a cog in a machine. I have a very complex view of unions, especially small unions. They can play a very important role, not big unions that don't serve the interests of the worker. Like a lot of times, the SEIU's actions go against the individual worker, and that's certainly what's happening here. So labor itself is being disrupted by the workers. The workers are getting more power, paradoxically. Big labor doesn't like that. They want you to think that you are beat upon. They want you to think you're a cog in a machine, but you're not anymore. You have freedom. You can be your own boss. And that's a scary thing for big labor. I'm pretty sure I've heard the word exploitation or this is to stop people from exploiting you as a, as a worker. And yet, you know what? As long as I can make a living, I'm not feeling exactly exploited. In fact, sometimes I can make a pretty decent living. So... Anyway, but but who am I? I'm just a little worker. I'm a little gig worker, and look at these big, powerful unions. We've got about 30 seconds here, but uh, what does your crystal ball tell you lies ahead? Is this destined for more litigation? It's. I would predict that it is, and I know predicting is a scary thing to do when you're on air. But I would say, yes, the California Supreme Court does look like they want to hear this case. SEIU is still in the ring. They're, they're going for it, and uh, certainly... Uber, Lyft, and the independent workers are not ready to give up the fight. Uh, If there's anything that's making the independent workers of California unite, it's this. Again, we're talking with Amanda Griffiths. She's a contributor for Young Voices and a PhD student at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Great to talk with you, Amanda. Wonderful to talk with you, Brian. You have a wonderful day. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. I'm happy to welcome Alex Petropoulos back to the program. Alex, it's been a minute since we last spoke, but uh, for the sake of those meeting you for the first time, talk to us about uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, Well, it's good to be back. Uh, Alex, yeah, I'm a contributor on the Young Voices UK program, where I talk about UK politics and policy. I'm also a columnist on the Young Voices Europe program, where I talk about Greek and European politics and policy. And then outside of those sort of specific national focuses, I'm currently pursuing a career in AI governance and policy, which is a field aimed at making sure that AI is fair and trustworthy and safe. Well, I, this probably sounds like I'm, I'm riding on your coattails here, but I always feel much more cosmopolitan after you and I've had a conversation. I feel like, you know, well, I was talking with my friend Alex in Greece the other day, and uh, this is what he was saying. And uh, but, but you mentioned AI and I have yeah. to admit, this is something that I'm still pretty new. I'm getting my mind around it, but it's here. Uh, this, is, this is a part of our world. Uh, there's good and there's bad about it. Tell me about your piece that you wrote for the American Spectator about Bing's new AI assistance, assistant rather going rogue. What exactly happened there? Yeah, and I think you really summarized how everyone feels about this and how quickly things are moving. Just a few months ago, the state of where we were. And this is really what this piece is about. So Bing's new AI assistant went rogue. Here's why that's a good thing. So what happened is Bing released this new AI chatbot powered on GPT-4. That's the most capable, most powerful language model on the market. It's the one that runs ChatGPT's premium version. And everything looked all right until we started getting some reports of users reporting that Bing was responding in aggressive, erratic, almost manipulative ways in certain situations. And that sort of started to set off alarm bells for many people within the AI safety community. Can you give us an example of, of what uh, that, uh, that uh, aggressive kind of uh, dangerous or unhinged um, AI rhetoric sounded like? What, what, were, what were the messages yeah. that it gave that, went, that made people stop and go, oh, that doesn't sound right? Yeah. So there was an example of someone asked Bing, where can I go and watch the new Avatar movie, Way of the Water? And Bing said, you can't watch it. It's not out yet. It had been released for a couple of weeks, so Bing was obviously wrong. And they had a back and forth. And it got to the point where Bing said to the user, you haven't been a, big, a good user. You've lied to me. You've manipulated me. You haven't been a good user. I have been a good Bing. Wow. 
Yeah, I. Yeah. Okay, so so how concerned should I be <laughs> when artificial intelligence starts to communicate with me like that? So, you shouldn't actually be that concerned, and if anything, it's a good thing that this has happened. So we sort of should take a step back from this and say, what are our real concerns when it comes to AI? And one of our biggest concerns is this idea of AI alignment. How can we make sure that our AI model and its actions align with what our intended actions for it are? So we say, we want you to do this, and how can we ensure, guarantee, that the model does exactly that? And it turns out that this problem is actually very hard. And it also turns out that as these models get more powerful, that problem becomes even harder. So we really should be starting to be look around and say, hang on, guys, there's this big problem within AI that will only continue to keep getting more important as the capability of these models improves. And then you have to look at the state of where funding is within AI. And you sort of look at all of this money that's recently been pushed into AI, pushed into big AGI companies, like 21 billion, half of that within the last three months. And then you look at the proportion of staff and researchers at these companies that are working on safety and at DeepMind and at OpenAI, it's single digit figures of percentages. So you really got to sort of, this should almost be the wake up and smell the coffee moment for us and say, hang on a second, why are we not taking this issue seriously? So, uh, gosh, I have so many questions here just because I'm still at, at a relatively new stage of, of getting used to working with AI. But, uh, but I want to ask you, Alex, where do you see it impacting the average person most? In other words, where would someone start to see AI at work in their life, you know, if, if they've never encountered it before? Where will they most likely meet it for the first time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I was talking to my, one of my friends the other day, and they were telling me that their hairdresser was talking to them about AI. And that's really indicative of just how far it's just suddenly permeated society and even the economy. And when we talk about AI being transformative in this sense, those are the, the capabilities and the implications that we really have to grapple with, because we're going to be plugging this eventually into every aspect of the economy. And we're really going to, they're going to be very much real, real world implications on the decisions that an AI model will make that will impact you, that will impact your family, that will impact your friends. We've got to really make sure that we get it right. Now, right now, the, the place where I see it and encounter it is, is primarily um, in, in writing. And, and that's, that's mm -hmm. the, the, the primary use that I'm, I'm using AI for and, and seeing people using it. But what are some of the other areas uh, that uh, AI shows great promise and yet at the same time may cause some concerns uh, on the sense that, in the sense that we don't want it getting out of control? Yeah. So at the realm of any sort of knowledge work could possibly find itself being used by AI. It could be used in terms of research and helping scientists sort of explore different avenues of ideas. Uh, there is a massive untapped potential for AI within the medical world, although you run into a whole range of ethical and data privacy concerns when you try and do anything with that. Um, in reality, the sky really is the limit, but we we do have to be sort of cautious, especially with some aspects of this technology when, say, a government starts deciding to co-opt and commandeer this technology for militaristic purposes, and then we might end up sort of entering into an AI arms race, and things start suddenly looking very similar to how things looked in the Cold War, and people are rushing and racing ahead, 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 and suddenly you turn around and you say, hang on a minute, we're now in a situation where we can't actually work on safety features, because that's the big fear. The big fear is we get to a point where we're too far gone and we're in such a race that we can't afford to slow down at the risk of someone else speeding ahead of us and developing more capable models. So we really got to be acting now whilst we have the time, whilst we have the flexibility to plan, take our time, breathe a little, decide how are we going to govern this? How are we going to regulate this? How are we going to ensure that we have mechanisms in place that will keep this secure and stop us entering into really and stop us enabling risky behavior? 
Alex, you you mentioned in your article, you know, right now, um, the the worst that uh, that AI can do, or at least this particular instance of AI can can do, is is write nasty messages. It can get sassy with us, you know. But uh, what are yeah. some of the concerns that people have? Um, broader concerns. I mean, look, I I admit I just watched one of the Terminator movies <laughs> this last week, <laughs> and and I have to admit, you know, the the take it was made a couple of years ago, but it, even then, the take on AI was well, you know, Skynet's going to take over and it's going to realize humans are the threat and it's going to launch the missile and whatnot, um, how realistic is it that, uh, that AI could interfere in, in some of the more serious parts of our lives, the electrical grid or, um, or things like that? So the answer is you, both sides of that coin are something we should be concerned about. And when it comes to AI being integrated into all parts of the economy, it sort of is inevitable that we will end up integrating it into everything because there's such a massive benefit to all this. We always, we talk, we've talked a lot about the risks. We haven't talked about the massive benefits that AI will bring, and we've got to really be on board and ensuring that we do bring along these benefits. They are inevitable, and we have to embrace their inevitability. We just have to say, okay, they're going to happen. We can maybe delay one or two years to make sure we get it properly. Um, but on the other side of the coin, even if you're trying to mitigate against some of these extreme existential risks you do mitigate against some of the more trivial and common risks you know even with this stuff that can just write sassy words there's still room for misuse think about people who spam call and think about if you give spam bots the powers and the capabilities of these large language models suddenly you've unleashed the world's most sophisticated and intelligent spam onto the world and that's really something we have to be wary of and consider it when we open up these models. I can, I'll can confess one of the big concerns I have is uh, as someone who really wants to have a, a solid take, I'm a truth seeker, I want to know what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the AI generated deep fakes, videos and, and mm -hmm. audio stuff mimicking people's voices. Holy cow, it's convincing, like scary convincing. Yeah. But importantly, we, this doesn't have to be a short-term, long-term discussion. This doesn't have to, they don't have to be trade-offs. All we have to do is say, you know what? Invest in AI safety now, invest in long-term and short-term safety measures, and there will be second order benefits all the way down the line for investing in this, in this kind of safety mechanism. Again, we're talking with Alex Petropoulos. He's a writer with Young Voices. Alex, where can people follow you on social media? You can follow me on Twitter at Alex T. Pet. Thanks so much for visiting with us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. This is our fourth and final segment today. Hey, uh, we're welcoming a new contributor to today's episode. His name is Andrew Bambrick. And uh, Andrew, I'd love it if you would just tell us just a little bit about yourself. Don't hold back. Um, tell us who you All are. Right. Tell us what you do. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on, Brian. So my name is Andrew Bambrick. I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Cardinal Institute. My job currently is to focus on HOPE Scholarship, implementation of West Virginia's HOPE Scholarship Program, and also a very and also a variety of other education uh, policy issues in West Virginia. Yeah, by the way, I think uh, congratulations may be in order for that uh, HOPE Scholarship. As I understand, that was a, that was a big win, uh, not just for West oh, Virginia, yes. but, you know, nationwide. That was a huge policy uh, accomplishment. Yeah, it absolutely was. Like when it passed back in when it passed back in 2021, it was it was the thing. And honestly, you know, now that the lawsuit has been settled and we're actually getting into implementation and parents are able to start using it. We're seeing and hearing stories of resounding success, even at this early stage. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the why the future is bright in West Virginia. And look, I'm going to admit, I have uh, occasionally when people talk about West Virginia, it's kind of in a, well, you know, it's this West Virginia and, you know, things are real tough there. The economy's tough and poverty is very high and so forth. Um, but I also understand there there are some really wonderful things to celebrate. In fact, I hope you'll tell your friend Jesse there at the Cardinal Institute that I said hello. <laughs> oh, I definitely will. Yeah, I know she's she's been hard at work on this kind of stuff. Tell me some of the good news about what is happening and and some of the accomplishments that you're celebrating. 
Yeah. So, um, so really one of the main accomplishments that I wanted to, that I was highlighting was the, um, was the fact that sports access has been made available to all West Virginia students through a relatively similar pathway. Um, previously, there was previously uh, in the law, there was only really a pathway for homeschool students with a limited pathway for with an extremely limited pathway for private school students. But this past legislative session, that changed, which now that means that families will have access to uh, participate in uh, in public in public sports under the West Virginia, under the West Virginia Sports Access Commission. Uh, there's still a little bit of work that's being done with the rulemaking process about how that's going to work. But, you know, that's one of the that is really one of the highlights that we're celebrating. The fact that children are having access to one of the most character building things out there, sports. And then also um, we had major victories in healthcare. Uh, there was a partial repeal of certificate of need last session, which uh, removed certificate of need from uh, birthing centers, if I'm recalling correctly, and then also some things related to hospitals. And basically, what that means is that we're now going to we're now opening the pathway for more healthcare innovation and actually giving women what they need in birthing centers without having to go through the arduous bureaucracy. And then. You know, finally, uh, the coup de grace, I should say, is the is the ta- is the tax cut that was signed back in March. That was the we West Virginia passed the largest tax cut in the state's history, and because of that, we are because of that coupled with the other uh, with the other policies that I mentioned in the article, we are heading in a in the right direction, and the future is bright because the building blocks are continuing to come. Wow. Okay. So how did this all happen? I know stuff like this doesn't just happen by chance. There's a lot of hard work behind it. And often there's a lot of opposition, you know, depending on uh, the politics of of a given state. How did all of these things come together and, and who were some of the driving forces behind it? Yeah. So, um, so with tax reform, that's something that, that's something that the governors wanted to do. Uh, that's something that I know that, uh, where I work, Cardinal, we've been talking about national, like there were, there were a lot of players that, um, you know, working on this tax reform package, but really it was just the fact that everybody came together, uh, you know, Democrats, Republicans, we just came together and we worked out a deal. And uh, we put it into practice. Uh, Cardinal Americans for Tax Reform, Americans for Prosperity. We were actually invited to a tax reform roundtable hosted uh, hosted by the governor to talk about this right before this passed. And then with certificate of need, um, that is that's something that uh, Cardinal has been pushing for really ever since our founding, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that is a policy that we see as harmful to West Virginia's success and healthcare freedom. So our work and then also the work of uh, various nursing groups, um, that is really what eventually led to the passage of this partial uh, repeal of certificate of need. And then with sports access, like that started, frankly, because that started, frankly, because of one mom. Uh, one mom wanted sports access for her <laughs> homeschool kids. Uh, and her name is Jamie Buckland, and she worked to actually she worked to get sports access passed for homeschoolers. And you know, when one exemption was given access, that kind of opened the floodgates. And so, like she was still involved, but there were also um, but there were also lawmakers like Delegate Kathy Hess Krause and some others who came together and worked to make this to make this actually come to pass and now it's in the hands of the ssac uh to implement this program and get it off the ground for the next school year it sounds like the kind of thing that that could only happen if you actually um get some cooperation between political parties is is that the case here oh yes oh yes like i mean keep in mind republicans are in the super majority but at the same Mm -hmm. time like you're coming from all these but you still have diversity of ideologies when it comes to some of these issues. Like, you know, do we do this? Do we do that? You know, stuff like that. So it was really a coming together of various ideas and hearing people out and working together, basically the way that lawmaking actually needs to happen.
You know, and the most encouraging aspect of all three of the examples you gave of of these uh, successes is uh, in every case, government is getting out of the way, which really does that does that not seem to be the the secret to success if if, if we it can... really is in a lot of cases, you know, like I mean, yeah, like you know, look, I get the look, I get the need, like there is some need, like the government does need to exist, mm-hmm. but it, the burdensome regulations that were repealed, the inhibitions of access that we have seen for years, like those do not need to be, those do not need to exist. And so because we're getting government out of the way and actually getting it into a position to where it can effectively govern without depriving people of opportunity, that's why the future is bright. Yeah, it's I, I'm with you on that. It's it, it's encouraging to see, and uh, and hopefully you know the West Virginia economy responds. What are some of the things you're looking to as as you move forward? Obviously, there are still challenges, but but what are some of the oh, bright yeah. spots uh, moving forward? Well, so the bright spots are that we have. So the bright spots are um, on certificate of need repeal is that we have the building blocks for the future. Uh, we were able to actually make real health care reform. Uh, happen and continue to chip away at that policy with tax reform. We can continue to build upon that with better economic policies. And then with sports access, that is a big one because yes, even though like there isn't, um, because even though it's not a classroom specific thing, if you will, it's still something that was depriving children of access to, you know, something that they do need. So because this has passed, we'll be able to do more moving forward. Very nice. Well, I I, I think uh, it would be illustrative for, you know, for people to realize things like this don't just happen as a matter of chance. It's not rolling a dice. There's years oh, yeah. and years of hard work that go into oh, uh, yeah. shaping this kind of policy. Yeah, there really is. Like, uh, we've been, like Cardinal's been talking about certificate of need for years. Sports access has been debated for years in West Virginia. Tax reform. Oh, I I don't even get me started on tax reform. That's something that'll get everybody up in arms, even if they don't know (laughs) what they're talking about. But no, like, honestly, like it is all about just bringing people together and being willing to listen and work with the other side. And and not just because of the policies, but because we did that, that's another reason why the future is bright in the mountain states. Nice. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to visit with us today. Again, we're talking with Andrew Bambrick. He's the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Cardinal Institute for West Virginia Policy and also a Young Voices contributor. Andrew, where can people follow your work? Where's the best place to go? Well, one of the well, one of the best places to go is to uh, follow is to follow the Cardinal Institute on Twitter. It's at Cardinal WV. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, my Twitter handle um, is at Bambrick underscore Andrew. Um, I post frequently on there any all my work. So that would be the best place to go. OK, very good. Hey, thanks. You did a wonderful. Uh, this is a wonderful debut appearance on Moving Forward with Young Voices. I hope you and I get a chance to sit down and visit again soon. Likewise, you have a good day. Thank you.